welcome to our very last program for summer reading. We've been doing animals oh all summer. And now we have some really fun animals. This is Emma from Chewankee, and she'll tell you. She's got a lot of information for us. I think I was already asking her questions, but I'll let her, I'll let her um, share all of her information with you. But before I do that, don't forget, if you have any of the summer reading paperwork, if you've been filling out the papers for reading or doing activities, to turn them in today or tomorrow at the very latest, because we're picking winners. Make sure you do that. Now. I'll let Emma take over. Thanks, Emma. Wonderful. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Great. Great. Well, my name is Emma, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, says my name right here, if you forget it. And I came here today from Chuanki, which uh, is right here. Raise your hand if you've heard of Chuanki before. Anybody? A couple people. Raise your hand if you've ever seen one of our Chuanki animal presentations before couple people. Awesome. Um, Richard, have you ever been to Chuanki before in West Cassett, Maine? I have. Oh, yeah. Some people who are like, definitely. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I'll just give you a little bit more information about what Chuanki is, what we do, and then we'll dive into our presentation for today. So um, Chuanki is an environmental education center, uh, which is a fancy way of saying we really love to teach people about nature and the outdoors. Raise your hand if you enjoy exploring nature and the outdoors. Yes, there's so much to do and learn. Um, so we have some schools up at Chuanki. We have a, a place-based um, elementary middle school for local students and something called a semester school for 11th grade students that come from all over the country. Um, we have a summer camp and that's actually how our organization started way back in 1915 as a summer camp. So um, we, ha we take kids outdoors, um, play and do all sorts of uh, fun activities at camp. We take older teenagers out on camping trips. So things like kayaking, hiking, um, canoeing all over Maine and Canada. And then we have some school and community programs. We have a program for middle school students who come to our campus for four days and camp out in tents and do things like team building and group challenges and cook their food over a fire and do ecology lessons. Um, and then we have a mentorship program in our local school district. And last but not least, this program, which is called the Traveling Natural History Program. We hop in our cars, we travel all around the state of Maine, and we come to wonderful libraries like this. We come to schools, community centers, senior homes, anywhere that wants to learn a little bit about nature and the outdoors. So today we are going to talk about a very special group of animals um, that we have here in Maine uh, called reptiles. So this presentation is called Scales and Tails. Um, and I have some really neat things up here on this table that we're going to get a chance to see and touch. If I don't pass um, every single thing on this table around, uh, know that at the end I will um, welcome you up to this table to look at and gently touch any of these things I have up here. I do want to point out I have a lot of real things up here. Some of these are toys, right? But many of them are real. And I did not go out and hunt any animals to get these items. Um, these items came from animals that passed away. Um, maybe they were old. Uh, maybe they had some kind of accident. Um, and we preserved parts of them uh, to use them for teaching and learning. Uh, and we actually have special permits, basically permission slips uh, from the state of Maine and, and the country to say that we can do that. So it's very special that we can have them. Uh, we'll be really gentle when we pass them around so they're in good condition for the next group. Um, but even more exciting, hold on one second, okay? Then the stuff I have on the table is I do have three live animals to share with all of you. So my live animals are actually in a couple different bins back here tucked behind the table um, and they have breathing holes in there uh, so they can get some fresh air, but they don't have any big windows. So they can't see any of you right now. Come on in and join us, folks. You're welcome to come on and join us. There's plenty of space on the grass, too, if there's not enough chairs. Um, just uh, we want to maintain like a little walkway in the front here. Uh, so how do you think my animals know that all of you are here if they cannot see you? Maybe raise your hand if you have an idea about that. How do they, how do they know you're here if they can't see you? What do you think, friend? Okay, okay. What about you? They can what do you hear think? Us. Yes, very good. They can hear you or maybe uh, 
less traditional hearing, but sort of feeling vibrations. So in general, they're gonna feel more comfortable and more welcome to come out and say hello if um, we're a little bit on the quieter side. Even though we're outside the library, I think you all have uh, probably a good sense of like, you're a little quiet at the library, right? So we're gonna be a little quiet out here. Um, I'd love for us to raise hands if we have questions or answers. That's a great way for us to take turns talking. Um, if you have a really cool story that you'd like to share with me, uh, maybe even something like an animal you saw one time that you wanna tell me about, I love stories, but I'm gonna ask you to basically take it out of your brain, stick it in your pocket, and save it until the end. That is a great time for stories um, and helps us stay on track. Uh, and I will try to get as many hands uh, as I can throughout the presentation, but I also wanna make sure that we see all the really cool stuff that I brought. So if I don't call on you and move on, please know that it's not personal. I'm just trying to keep us on track. Does that sound good to everybody? Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so we're gonna talk about reptiles today. Um, and I wanna see, first of all, if we can name the five different types of reptiles and then we're going to talk about what all those animals have in common. What makes them a reptile and different from something like a bird or an amphibian or a mammal. So raise your hand if you know an example of a reptile. Could be um, a group of reptiles or maybe one that you know. What do you think? A box turtle. Okay, so turtles and tortoises. That is one group of reptiles. Very good. What else? Yes. Snakes. Snakes. Awesome. That is another group of reptiles. Nicely done. Crocodilians. Yeah, which is one of my favorite words. That is alligators, crocodiles, and some different cousins that they have in that group. Very good. What about you? Um, lizards. Lizards. Nice job. Lizards is one of the most large and diverse groups of reptiles. And then if someone can get the last one, the fifth one, you can get a high five for me because this one's really hard. Does anyone know the fifth type of reptile? Axolotl. Whoa, axolotl. That is a very cool animal. Um, I believe that is in the group of amphibians. A whale? Do you know? I, I was going to say amphibians. Oh, okay. Amphibians and reptiles get confused a lot. And actually, we have a big group um, that both of them fit into, which is herpetofauna. We call them herps. But they're actually different in a lot of really important ways. Um, has anyone ever heard of a tuatara? It's a couple people. Other people are like, nope, I don't know what that is. Yeah, tuataras, that is the fifth group of reptiles. So I'll pull this poster out. This has some drawings of those five groups of reptiles that we just named. Tuataras all the way down at the bottom, down here. Um, tuataras are very ancient. Uh, they've been around basically since the dinosaurs were on earth. Uh, and they are also endangered. Does anyone know what it means when an animal is endangered? Right here, what do you think? What do you think in the pink? I'm calling on this friend in the pink. What do you think? Very good. There aren't very many of them left, and they only live way across the world in parts of New Zealand. So they're a very unique animal, and not a lot of people have heard of them. They look a lot like lizards, but they're a little different than lizards. So this makes up sort of the main groups of reptiles, and I want us to look at all these animals and think about what are the things that all these animals have in common, things that they all have or do, or at least most have or do, that makes them a reptile and makes them different from birds, mammals, amphibians, fish, right? What do you think? They have scales. Very good. They have scales. That's part of the title of this presentation, right? So they have dry, scaly skin on the outside of their body. A lot of people think that these animals are slimy, um, but actually wet, slimy skin is what frogs and salamanders and other amphibians have. These animals have dry, scaly skin. Very good. What's something else they all have or do? Yes. What do these animals all have or do? We're a little shy. That's okay. We're a little shy. What do you think? Um, they all go water. Oh, that's a great guess. Although there are plenty of land dwelling um, uh, reptiles that maybe even live in a desert where there is no water. So they don't all have to go in water. What do you think? Some outer bones? Yeah. They, they have inner bones. They have scales on the outside, but you're right that they all have backbones. That is an important thing about reptiles. I'll give you a couple hints for these last couple. Um, 
how are these animals for the most part born or how do they begin their life? Does anyone know how a reptile begins its life? What do you think? That's okay. It's really fun to raise our hands. Sometimes it's scary to actually say something out loud. What do you think? Yeah, most of them hatch out of eggs. Very good. Uh, there are a, a couple of them that give live birth or um, they keep the eggs inside their body and then they hatch out of those so it looks like they give live birth. But for the most part, uh, they lay eggs. Very good. Um, and there's one more that has to do with their blood. Raise your hand if you know what might have to do with their blood. Do you know? Nice job. They're cold blooded. Does anyone know what that actually means? Does it mean their blood is freezing cold all the time? Do you want to tell me? What does it mean? It means it's like a polar bear. Oh. <laughs> cold, polar bears live in a cold place, but they are actually warm-blooded. Reptiles are cold-blooded. What does that actually mean? It's true. So take your hands, put them on your cheeks. Your cheeks feel pretty warm? Yeah. That's because warm-blooded animals like us and polar bears make their own heat. When you eat food and drink water, your body makes its own heat. All you have to do when you're cold is snuggle under a blanket or put a jacket on. Uh, something like a snake or a turtle, right? What did they have to do to get warm? Because their body does not make its own heat. They might wrap around a warm surface, like a rock. Absolutely. What's something else they can do? What do they bask in? What do they, what do they go bask in like? <laughs> yeah? They, they can lay on a rock in the sun. They bask in the sun. Very good. They have to use their environment to heat and cool their body. So oftentimes we'll see them basking in the sun. Uh, maybe you've seen turtles on a log in the middle of a pond doing that or a snake on a rock doing that, right? Uh, they like to bask in the sun. That's how they warm their body. If they get too warm, they go in the water, they go in the shade, they cool it down. So those are the three main things um, that, that reptiles have. I'm gonna pass around a couple of things uh, that are related to those. Um, I don't have anything to pass around related to cold blooded because that's a little bit more abstract, but I will pass around some uh, scales, right? This is some skin that was shed by some of our reptiles. Some of our reptiles shed skin maybe all in one piece or in really big pieces, which is a little different than how we shed our skin. Uh, and I'm also going to pass around some eggs. Um, these eggs, unfortunately, these are from a milk snake. They were laid in a place that was too hot and too dry for these animals to survive. So it's sad that they didn't survive. But what's interesting about this um, little display is that these eggs are shriveled up like a raisin, which is not something that a bird egg does. Does anyone eat chicken eggs for breakfast sometimes? No, I, no that's I, okay. You don't have to. Have You're probably familiar though with the hard shell around a bird egg, right? If I take a chicken egg and I put it on this table and I leave it there for two weeks and I come back two weeks later, will it look any different? No, no it'll probably be gross on the inside. But that shell is hard and nothing really happens to that unless it breaks. Um, reptile shells, reptile egg shells are different. They're, they're almost like leather or cloth and they're flexible. And that means that they can kind of shrivel up when they get too dry, which is what you'll see in this picture. So um, these are not meant to open. They're just meant to look through the window. So I usually recommend you can count to about five in your head. When you get to five, just pass it to your neighbor. We'll start one of them kind of weaving around this way. We'll start one of them over here and Hopefully they'll pass across. Okay, if for some reason this misses you, uh, you can definitely see it uh, up at the table at the end. Sound good? Do you have a question? Um, yeah, is that, is that, is there an egg that's in that jar right there? That's true, yeah. There's a turtle egg in this jar that's preserved in alcohol. So it, it hasn't shriveled up because it's preserved in a liquid. So that's a little bit different. Yeah, good observation. Nope, there's no, it's just a white and a yolk inside. There's no like baby reptile in there, if that makes sense, yeah. All right, so we did a great job naming all the types of reptiles and what makes a reptile. I want a quick hand, someone who can tell me, there's actually only a couple of different reptiles that we find in the wild here in Maine. If you go out exploring in the summer, maybe you're gonna see some reptiles, but not all five of these groups. So which reptiles do we see in the wild here in Maine? Yes. Okay, so. That's awesome. So that is a great example of 
turtles, right? We know that we have turtles here in Maine. We have a bunch of native turtles. What else do we have here in Maine in the wild? Snakes. Snakes, very good. Awesome. I'd love to hear stories about sightings at the end. Thank you so much. So snakes and turtles, we do not have wild crocodilians, lizards, or tuatars here. Generally, those animals live in slightly warmer places, but turtles and snakes have figured out how to live in a place where there's winter. Does anyone know what those animals do in the winter? Any ideas? What do you think? They hibernate. Very good. We call it brumation. It has a little bit of a different name, but they basically hibernate. Uh, they hang out in a safe place um, until the winter's over and then they come out. So I would love uh, to talk a little bit more about turtles and snakes. And then we're also going to talk about lizards at the end and we'll look at some live members as well. So I'm going to talk about a couple of turtle features, pass around some of these things and we'll get to meet uh, a live turtle. Okay. Turtles are the only reptile with this shell. This is a really, really cool adaptation, we call it. Something they have on their body that helps them to survive. Why is this helpful? Why do turtles have shells? Why is it important for them to have shells? To hide from, to, to hide from predators. Very good. They don't want to become prey. They want to hide from predators. And not just hide, because it, it might allow them to kind of camouflage or hide a little bit. It, there's something even on top of that that this helps with. Oh, and on top of camouflage and hiding, okay. like what happens if a predator actually tries to bite this? It, uh, it, protects. it protects them. Very good. It is protection. Does anyone know what a turtle shell is made out of? Yeah. Raise your hand if you have a guess. What is a turtle shell made from? What do you think? Wood. That's a great guess. It's not made from wood, but it is hard. Like wood. It's actually harder than some wood. That is another good guess. Think about something that we have in our body that this animal would have in its body that's hard. Steel. What was that? Cement. Steel or cement. Uh, keratin. Oh, very good. Keratin is what the top coating is. If you don't know what keratin is, you can look at your fingernails and feel your hair. That's what keratin is, a material that makes up those parts of our body. So it's keratin on top. Underneath it is? I was going to say what the shell is. Bone. Bone. It's bone. It's made of bone. That's why it's so strong. If you look inside this turtle shell, as I pass it around, you're going to see the backbone right on the underside of this top of the shell. Can a turtle ever walk out of its shell when it feels like it? No. Like, oh, take a big stretch. No. Can we take our backbone out when we feel like it? No. We cannot. That would be that would be weird. Yeah, we can't do that. So they can't ever crawl out of their shell. So if you ever see a turtle shell like this, right, that's empty, that means this turtle is no longer alive. This shell is part of their skeleton. It grows with them throughout their whole life. Okay, so I'll pass this around. This one is from a snapping turtle and it's missing the bottom part of the shell. So you can see that spine really well right on the underside there. And you can also see, um, this was uh, dropped a few times a couple years ago, and so you can see where the keratin has flaked off and the bone underneath, okay? So I'll pass this around. Here you go, and I'll pass this one around here. One more thing I wanna show you about turtles before we see a live turtle, nice job, is there's a couple different types of turtles that we have. We have turtles that live on land and tortoises, Turtles that live in fresh water. And then what's the third type of special turtle that we actually do have some of in Maine though we don't see them very often? Saltwater. Sea turtles that live in salt water, exactly. So that snapping turtle would have webbed toes for swimming, but claws, right? Because they're gonna move around on land a little bit as well as in the water. Sea turtles in general, this is a realistic toy. They look more like this. Do we see any claws? They don't have claws, they have flippers, very good. Because they pretty much spend almost all of their life in the water, in the ocean, and the females only come up on land for one reason. What is the reason why a sea turtle would come up on land? To lay its eggs. Very good to lay its eggs. Bury them in the sand. Bury them in the sand, exactly. So we don't have, excuse me, sea turtles burying their eggs in the sand way up here in Maine because it's too cold. It's usually down in places like Georgia and Florida. Um, but they basically like waddle up the beach, they dig a hole, they lay their eggs and they go back into the water. Um, and the baby turtles, when they're born, they waddle down the beach, go back into the water 
and they'll only come back to the beach if they grow up to be a female they'll come back to that same beach to lay their eggs um one more thing if you look at this shell do you see how flat it is yeah, yeah it's for shooting through the water really well a lot of people know that sea turtles um, are slow on land most turtles are slow on land will you hold on they're fast in the water so their shell is flat so they can shoot through the water really well right um but they don't really have a lot of room to pull their body into their shell right there's not really enough room for them to hide inside their shell not very many turtles can do that but i did bring a turtle that can do that um, and i'll get it out in a second i'm not going to pass around this great big sea turtle but i will pass around a couple of skulls this is a great size comparison for you this skull right here uh, goes to that snapping turtle shell that we're passing around right so that's probably um, that would be almost a, a two foot long turtle if you had head to tail okay this is a sea turtle skull how big do you think the shell of this animal was what do you think maybe not 20 feet but probably close to my wingspan <laughs> So this is from a loggerhead turtle, which is the second largest sea turtle in the world. We have some really big sea turtles out there potentially uh, swimming around the Gulf of Maine. We just don't get to see them very often. Yes. I know how very bumpy The it is. largest sea turtle is a, the leatherback. The leatherback sea turtle is the biggest one. So this one, we're going to have to be careful and use two hands with, okay? Can you hold this with two hands? Nice job. And this one has a stick to keep its mouth open, but the mouth doesn't move. So you can just sort of look at the mouth. You can check out how there's sharp edges on that beak-like mouth. You wanna take that? They don't have any teeth. Thank you. And I'll also pass around this foot. Okay. You guys can start with this one here. Would you like to sit down? No, I just wanna, I just wanna touch and feel things. You wanna to touch and feel things? If you wanna to touch and feel things, if you sit down, things will get passed to you. Will you sit right down? It's a good spot for you. No? Okay. All right. Well, I tried. I just feel like standing. You feel like standing? Okay. Uh, you can stand back there a little bit. I just want to make sure you're not right in front of the camera, my friend, okay? Um, I'm going to get ready to get my first live animal out. It is going to be a turtle. Um, this is how it's going to work. He's trying to pass that to you, my friend. Um, I'm going to walk around with him in my hands. Um, we're not going to get to touch him. We're just going to look with our eyes. So if you need a reminder, you can take your hands and put them like this in your lap. If for whatever reason you are feeling nervous about seeing this turtle up close, um, if you are of any age and you want me to just stay a little further away from you, you can take your hand like this, put it right next to your face like a little stop sign, and I'll go around you. If you have your hands in your lap, I'll come over to you a little bit closer so you can get a, a close look. Does that sound good to everybody? One other thing that's gonna help this turtle um, to be really comfortable is if we don't react with our voice when it comes out. If everyone goes, <gasps> that's gonna be a big loud noise, he's gonna get scared. So if we could be excited quietly, that would be helpful. If you think you know what kind of a turtle this is, um, what species, you can go ahead and raise your hand for me and I'll, I'll call on someone to see if we can guess. Sound good? Okay, I'm gonna get my turtle out and make sure I get the right box. So I, I am going to come around to everyone, but it's helpful if you stay where you are. Okay, so if you feel like standing, you can stand, but I don't want you to move towards me. I'm going to move towards you. Sound good? Cool. All right. We have our other friends that rejoin just in time. nice job with a, a, a sort of a quiet audience welcoming this turtle um, I will walk around so that everyone can see this turtle up close but I just want to give everyone like a little bit of a look here first does anyone have a guess what type of turtle this is we have a guess what type of turtle this is do you, do you have a guess a tiger turtle. a tiger turtle I love that guess uh, this turtle has some pretty impressive orange stripey patterns on its body but it is not called a tiger turtle what what do you think in the front right there oh nice job it is a box turtle it is called an eastern box turtle 
Okay, I will skip you. <laughs> um, this is called an Eastern box turtle. He has all these bright colors on his body, um, orange and red eyes, because he is a male Eastern box turtle. And this is actually a type of turtle that is native to Maine, but they are endangered. They're not endangered everywhere where they live, but they are endangered up here in Maine. We've actually never had a lot of box turtles up here in Maine. It's always been at the northern point of their range. Um, but over time, they have become less and less common. So if you ever see one of these in the wild and you're able to snap a photo and email the state biologist, they would be really excited to know that you saw an eastern box turtle. Um, the reason we have this eastern box turtle at Schwanke and he does not live out in the wild is because he was found walking around a populated area in Maine and somebody picked him up and he didn't seem like he was scared. He seemed like he was pretty used to people. And uh, they had the, the state biologist examine him, look him over, and a lot of things about how perfect his shell looked and other things made them think he was probably a pet that someone decided to let go. Um, the problem with that is if you have a, an animal for a long, long time and then you set it free, it doesn't necessarily remember how to be wild. Um, so we now have this turtle as an educational ambassador, which means that he helps us to teach about turtles and reptiles, um, but he's not gonna live out in the wild. He lives with us at Chwanki with yes, two other box turtles. Oh, that's okay, that's not gonna hurt him. Yeah, he was climbing around in his uh, box of dirt this morning. So yeah, I'm not surprised he has a little bit of a leaf stuck on his skin there. Um, does anyone know why this animal is called a box turtle? It's a special adaptation that they have that not all turtles have. Do you know? Okay, yeah, there's kind of two, two things I, that I commonly um, hear. One is that they have a boxy shaped shell. It's tall and dome shaped. It's not flat and uh, good at shooting through the water like a, a sea turtle or a snapping turtle. The other reason that it's called a box turtle is that this turtle is one of the only kinds that can pull its entire body into its shell and then it can actually close up like a box because it has a hinge on the underside of its shell which is called their plastron that allows them to basically close up like the front door and the back door of their shell like two drawbridges on a castle <laughs> that would be really handy if you're getting attacked by a predator and you can take this protective shell that's made of bone and then close up and just wait until that predator goes away and leaves you alone, um, that's a really good strategy. So it helps to keep the turtle safe. You waving? Yeah. Excellent. He's, so he looks this colorful because he's a, he's a male. Yeah, the females are more, are more drab. So similar to like a bright red cardinal, but the females are brown, right? That kind of a thing. It's the same thing. So he still has this pattern that would help him to camouflage, right? But it's a pattern with some flashier looking colors. The females are sort of like a, a pale yellow mixed with brown, whereas he's really like this orange and black with those bright red eyes. So I'll show you, if I can, this line right here, that's the hinge on the plastron. So if he were to get scared, he could close up two doors with everything inside to help protect him from predators. Really, really cool adaptation. Does anyone have any questions before we move on to our next set of reptiles? Um, I want to see how can you see him shut the door? Oh, can we see him shut the door? Um, uh, that would involve me probably trying to make him feel very scared, and I'm actually not even sure he would do it. <laughs> um, so I can't force him to close his door. You'll just have to trust me that he, he can do it. Maybe you can find a video of it somewhere, but he's not going to be able to demonstrate that for us. Yes? What are the leading factors of them becoming endangered? Yeah, there's a couple different things um, that these animals are facing as challenges. Will you hold on? I'll come back to you in one second. Um, one is that they have become very popular in the pet trade. Um, so they're very easy to catch, right? Uh, if you can find one, it's not going to outrun you, right? Um, so there was a, a pretty big trend of people selling these as pets and even shipping them overseas. Um, many of those animals unfortunately passed away because people don't really know how to take care of them well. 
um, or they, di they didn't uh, know how to take care of them well. So that's both maybe having them perish, but also just taking them out of the gene pool in the wild. And then the other real uh, big challenge for really all turtle species, but um, certainly endangered turtles, um, is car collisions. Raise your hand if you've seen a turtle trying to cross the road before. Yeah, I do. Yes, especially in early summer when most turtles are trying to find a good place to dig a hole and lay their eggs. There's a lot of turtle movement across roads. These animals are slow. Part of the reason that they're slow is that they have to carry this heavy shell around all the time. Are you trying to give that back to me? Thank you so much. Um, you're very patient. Uh, so if, if you ever have the opportunity to help a turtle safely cross the road, you definitely need to make sure you're safe yourself in the roadway. Um, but you can sort of stop traffic, let that turtle walk across the road. You can even pick them up if they're small enough. If you pick them up back here on either side of their tail, uh, they can't reach back and snap you or nip you with their mouth, even if they're a snapping turtle. They will probably pee on you um, because they, they're af afraid that you might be a predator and they want you to put them down. So you should wash your hands anytime you pick up a live animal. If they are too large for you to move that way, you can certainly gently use a bucket or a shovel or something like that. But my advice is always to move the turtle in the direction that it is heading. I've heard a lot of stories of people seeing a turtle at the edge of a roadway and there's a pond over here and they think silly turtle the pond's over there <laughs> they pick it up and they bring it down to the pond guess where that turtle came from <laughs> probably the pond and now it has to walk right all the way back to the road so it knows where it's going they have a really good sort of internal um, uh, pos positioning system essentially so if they want to go across the road this way you can help them cross the road that way i'm going to take uh, these last couple questions and then we got to move on i could talk about turtles all day but this is a reptiles presentation not a turtle presentation hold on did you have a question my friend do you remember Turtles hide what? They hide, they hide in shells. They're in the shell they, yeah, they also might like try to pull their body partially into their shell if you pick them up because they might be a little nervous. Yes. Um, I think he wants to either swim or walk. He's, wa he's trying to walk away in the air, but I have a good hold on him so he can't go anywhere. Yes. Um, my grandpa had a giant turtle in the backyard. And it was like, thank you. Sound, sounds like a snapping turtle. <laughs> it was, it was a big snapping turtle. I, I actually, one of my missions is in life is to help people understand the snapping turtle a bit more. People um, have some really negative ideas about snapping turtles. They think that like they're all going to run out and eat our small children in our yard, um, which obviously they're, they're not going to try to do. Um, they, they, they do get large. They do have sharp mouths, uh, as evidenced by that skull that I'm passing around. The reason that they are called a snapping turtle and that they snap is their arms, legs, head and tail are so long and big, there's no way that they can pull their body into their shell. They don't have any room to pull their body into their shell and protect themselves. So guess how they protect themselves? With their mouth, right? So people, I think, misunderstand that aggression. They're just trying to make you, the big predator looking thing, like stay away from them because they're, they're scared. So, if a, if a turtle, if a snapping turtle moves into your yard to lay some eggs, they're probably be, gonna be gone within 24 hours. Just like, you know, if you're feeling nervous, maybe give it some space or don't let your, you know, pet outside because you don't wanna, uh, you know, have an animal interaction and then they're gonna move on. Um, so uh, they're, just, they're just snapping because they're, they're scared and they're trying to defend themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm gonna move on now to the other type of reptile that we have here in Maine, which is? Snakes, very good. Snakes don't have shells, they don't have arms, and they don't have legs, right? This is a, a toy snake, but I just want to demonstrate that a lot of people think that snakes are just a head and a tail, right? That they don't really have a body because they don't have arms or legs, but they do have a body. It's actually quite hard to tell where their body is and where their tail begins if you're just looking at them from the outside. But I will show you um, the skeleton 
Uh, and it's pretty clear from looking at the skeleton where their body ends and their tail begins. So this is a really cool garter snake skeleton. That's one of the common snakes we would see around here. And you can see that the, the whole body has a long backbone, just like we do. Then they have a whole bunch of ribs. Point to where your ribs are. Right here, right? They have way more ribs than we do though, because they're very long and skinny. And their ribs end right about here, and that's where their tail begins. So in between there and there, that is their body. And they have all the same stuff that we have in terms of organs. They have a heart and lungs and a stomach and intestines. They're all just a little longer and skinnier than ours, right? So they are actually very similar to us in a lot of ways, even though they don't move around like us, right? They slither around on their belly, which is a little bit different than how we would move around um, with walking on top of our legs. So I will pass around, will you hold on one second? I'm gonna pass around this skeleton just so you can check that out. Okay, look at those ribs and that backbone. And snakes are very famous for being able to shed their skin all in one piece. Right? Has anyone ever found a snake skin maybe in their yard or something? Yeah. A lot of people find them in their wood piles or their stone walls. Those are great places for snakes to shed their skin uh, for two reasons. One is when they're getting ready to shed, they have to uh, go to a safe place that's sort of out of danger. So they might be hiding somewhere like in one of those places. The other reason why that might be a good place to shed their skin is they need to rub their body against something rough to peel their skin off their body. It comes off inside out. So imagine you have like a long sock on and you take it off inside out. That's how they slither out of their skin. So this picture is a garter snake in the middle of shedding, which is super cool. They have to be really well hydrated. They have to have a lot of nice moisture and water in their body for it to come off in one long piece like this. Otherwise it comes off in a bunch of different pieces. So I will pass this around. I will also pass this around. This is from one of our snakes at Chwanky, which uh, mostly had a good shed. I would say two thirds of her body, it came off in one piece. As you touch this, if, yeah, you can touch it, but when you touch it, um, don't, don't pull on it because it'll rip like a tissue. But if you kind of just touch it nicely like this, it'll stay together. Um, no matter what color a snake is, their skin is always this sort of pale translucent color because the pigment stays with their new skin underneath after they shed this skin. All right, did you have a question? What, what is your question? I've seen a snap and I've seen a that is an awesome story. Will you tell me that full story at the end? I would love to hear that. You guys wanna see this picture? Here you go, awesome. So I'm gonna get ready to get a live snake out. I know that some people might feel nervous about snakes and that's totally normal. There are a lot of scientists that think that we're actually hardwired to be afraid of snakes for evolutionary reasons, right? Survival reasons. Um, the snake that I have uh, will stay in my arms the whole time, uh, is very used to being handled by people and is not venomous. Um, so those are three things that might make you feel a little bit more comfy. Um, if you wanna see this snake up close, you can just have your hands comfortably in your lap like this. If you don't want to see the snake up close, but you are curious to see it a little further away, you can use that stop sign. I'll stay a little further away from you. If you're feeling like you're going into your yo-yo panico zone and you need to like step over there away from the situation, you can do that. And then you're welcome to rejoin afterwards. Okay. Um, so I, I like to tell people uh, before I get the snake out, um, if you have an idea what type of snake this is when I get her out, you are welcome to raise your hand. I'll give you a hint, which is that this species is not native to Maine. She is native to other parts of the United States, but she did not come from the wild here in Maine. She was a donated, unwanted pet. And she is snuggled under her towel here. Someone say, I want to have it. <laughs> you like, yeah, that sounds like someone who likes snakes. I like that. Um, so I'll walk around with her so you can see her up close. Maybe I'll, I'll start um, over here with these little ones and then I'll make my way around just like I did before. Does anyone have a guess what type of snake this is? 
before I tell you. Oh, we're going to raise our hand, right? Raise our hand. What do you think, friend? What's, what's your guess? I think it might be a grass snake. A grass snake? <laughs> Great guess. It is not a grass snake. Do you have a guess? Um, it, it is a, it's called, uh, it walks a, it, it's, a, it's called, it's called, we're not going to touch it. Okay, we're just going to look. Snake. A cannonball snake? Yeah, a cannonball. These are awesome names. One more guess. Oh, that's another great guess. This is called, are, are you saying Mimi because you want to see it up close? I just want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. Do you want to see this snake up close, my friend? Or do you want me to stay away from you? Do you want to see the snake up close? I, I don't. Okay. So, yep, I'll stay a little bit further away from you. I just want to make sure that I'm getting the right message from you so I don't do the wrong thing. This is called a corn snake. A corn snake. Sometimes people call them red rat snakes. That is another name for this same species of snake. They would live, that's okay. Um, they would live basically um, from like New Jersey all the way down to Florida and over into the Midwest. They don't live up in the Northeast. And I'll, I'd, I really like to tell about why they have the name corn snake because it's a little bit of a strange name. There's a couple reasons. Uh, that I've learned over the years. One is she has this really interesting pattern on her her belly scales which are called scoots. She has like a, a really cool kind of checkerboard black and white pattern on her scoots that remind people of maize or Indian corn which is like a dark and light colorful corn. Sometimes we use it for decoration in the fall in the fall harvest time. That is one reason that she's called a corn snake. Another reason that I've been told, will you hold on one second? is related to an old wives tale, which is that um, farmers would find these corn snakes hanging out in their corn fields and they would kill the snakes because they thought that they were eating their corn crop. Do we know anything about snakes? What do snakes eat? Do they eat corn? No. They do not eat corn. There are no snakes that I know of on the planet that have any desire to eat plants. They eat animals, right? So why would a snake like this want to hang out in a cornfield. What would it be doing hanging out in the cornfield? Any guesses? You're my ringer. Go ahead, friend. Hiding. Okay, H hiding, maybe, yeah. What do you think? Mice. Mice. Very good. They might be hanging out in the cornfield for a little mouse who might be attracted to eating some corn, and then they're going to eat the mouse. So actually, they were probably doing the farmer a favor, some free pest control. <laughs> um, but a lot of people have really negative ideas about predators in general and definitely snakes. So I think it's helpful for us to learn about animals, even ones that we're afraid of, because it often helps us um, understand them a little bit better. Uh, so she is not venomous. She doesn't have any fangs. We actually don't have any venomous snakes here in Maine anymore. There's only one species that uh, used to live here the timber rattlesnake, it's now extirpated from the state. Um, obviously where she is from, if you went down south, you'd um, interact with a few more um, spaces where there could be venomous snakes. So if she doesn't kill her prey with venom, how does she kill her prey? There's really only one other strategy that snakes use to kill and eat something like a mouse. Do you know? They swallow it whole. What do they do before they swallow it whole? Because it, it needs to be um, it. very good. It needs to be motionless before they're going to swallow it or else they're going to have a hard time swallowing. Yeah, they, they constrict. There, she's a constrictor, just like something that might be called a boa constrictor, right? That's a type of snake as well. So she'll grab it with her mouth. She'll wrap her body really tightly around it. She'll squeeze till it's no longer moving. And then this is my favorite part. She can open up her mouth so wide that she can swallow that prey down in one piece. So it would be like if you and I could open our mouth so big, we could swallow like a grocery store watermelon down our throat we wouldn't have to eat for like two weeks. Um, and they don't really unhinge their jaw. I've heard people say that before. It's not quite the same. Their jaw is not held together the same way ours is. They have really stretchy material here and here that basically allows them to open up their mouth like this and then wiggle their mouth around that big prey item. She is really, um, I think, happy to get some real sunlight right now. <laughs> She's doing some basking, which is cool. What does extirpated mean? Extirpated, yeah, thank you, means um, like 
extinct from a portion of its historical range. Um, so it's not extinct everywhere, it's extinct from an area. So the timber rattlesnake has populations other places, they just don't have any populations left in Maine. Very similar to the wolf, for the, the official uh, uh, wolf status in Maine is extirpated, though I'm sure some of them don't know where the Canadian border is and they're like hanging around, you know, up in northern Maine somewhere, but um, generally extinct from, a, you know, a place where it used to live. Do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, she's, um, she's smelling all of us. Yeah, she's using her tongue. Every time she sticks out her tongue, she's smelling. So snakes have a forked tongue. Will you hold on one second? And then love to get your question, okay? She's sticking out her tongue really rapidly. Every time she pulls her tongue into her mouth, she has two holes up in the roof of her mouth. And up above that is called her Jacobson's organ. And that reads the smell for her. So it tells her if she's smelling me or mice, right? Or something else. So they smell with their tongue, which is a pretty neat adaptation. What is your question? Um, I wish I could pet it. And can I see it a little bit closer? Um, so if you go sit in your seat, I'll take one more spin past you, okay? And then we have to uh, get ready to move on to lizards, okay? Um, one more thing, since I gave some advice about how to safely uh, move a turtle across the road, is I will give some advice for, for the snake enthusiasts that might be excited to um, interact with some snakes that we have here in Maine. Um, watching and observing from afar is always a great option. If you're excited about maybe trying to pick up a wild snake, I really want to make sure that you know that you have to support the whole body of the snake like I'm doing right now. If you're picking up a wild snake, they are going to think you're a predator. They're probably, probably going to try to move away from you and, and pee on you or musk you. So you'll have to wash your hands afterwards. But if you pick up a snake from right behind the head, and then support the rest of the body. That's really important. You don't want to pick the animal up from the tail or the head only because their whole body is pulling on their skeleton and it can hurt them, right? So if you're interested in picking up a snake and exploring it, you just want to do that safely and then put it back where you found it, okay? Awesome. One more question before I put her away. Um, can you find her in Maine? She is not a native species in Maine. She probably... Uh, looks most like, uh, though not the red color, but that sort of dark, light, banded color. She looks most like what we would call a milk snake up here, or maybe a northern water snake. But we don't have any corn snakes or red rat snakes up here in Maine. Um, and they're more reddish because, in general, the dirt down south tends to be more of a reddish brown. Um, that said, they have become quite popular pets and are captive bred for all kinds of color variations. So some are more orange, some are more pink, but those are often things that people are trying to breed for. Just like we try to breed like extra fluffy dogs or you know other, other things that we want as pets. Okay, how are we doing? Good? Okay, let's do a really quick stretch break before we move on to our last reptile. You ready? Yeah. Everyone stand up with me. Okay? We're gonna reach up and try to touch the sky. All the way up here. Reach down and try to touch your toes. Oh, I almost, almost can reach them. Okay, over to the side. And over to this side. Make a big circle with your neck. And go back the other way. Shake your left leg. Shake your right leg. Shake your left arm. Shake your right arm. Right, quietly shake them all. Nice job. Take a big deep breath. Let it out. One more time. Let it out. Awesome. Okay, I feel refreshed. We're going to sit back in our spot. And we're going to talk a little bit about lizards. Yeah. I'm going to pass around two lizard things, and then I'm going to go right to our live lizard. Here's the cool thing about lizards. There's so many different kinds. There are tiny lizards and giant lizards. There are lizards that eat animals, lizards that eat plants, lizards that live in the desert, lizards that live partially in the ocean. There's so many different kinds. Um, this is one that you may be familiar with. This is a toy gecko. Geckos have a couple of cool adaptations. Um, one is that they can use their sticky feet to climb up walls and even ceilings. Uh, just like spider feet, they have these really sticky pads on their toes. 
They also, um, this one is showing a line on the tail, which represents a pretty cool adaptation that a lot of geckos can do. What can this lizard do with its tail that would be a helpful thing that might help them get away from danger? Yes? Yeah, they can drop their tail. So if they are running away from a predator, predator grabs their tail, their tail can fall off and they can keep running, which is an awesome get out of jail free card, right? Um, sometimes their tail can grow back, sometimes not. That's the last resort because a lot of lizards store important fats and energies in their tail, so they don't just want to do that willy nilly. Um, but that is an adaptation that some of them have. The only lizard that comes even close to living up here in Maine is this lizard, which is called the five lined skink. They live up in parts of New York and Connecticut, believe it or not. They have figured out ways to hibernate during some winters. Um, and, and this is a picture of what they look like when they're babies and then when they're adults. And I'm gonna move on to my live lizard, which is a type of skink, but it's not a five line skink. It's much bigger and would be found in a more tropical area. You guys wanna check out the gecko? Here you go. Okay, and this animal, um, as lizards go, looks a bit more like a snake than some other lizards, which is actually something that might be an advantage to it. If a, if a predator thinks that it might be a snake, maybe it will stay away from it and leave it alone. I'm excited to see it. You're excited to see it? Yeah. I think it's a pretty cool animal. There are lots and lots of different types of skinks. And this one is named for a special part of her body, which we'll talk about in a moment. Oh my God. Okay, so I'll start up here. I can't force her to stick out her tongue, but when she does, that is the part of the, her body that she is named for. Does anyone have a guess what type of skink this is? Do you know? What even is that? What even is that? Well, I'm trying to tell you, bud. Nice job, a blue tongued skink. So like I said, I can't force her to stick out her tongue, but she does partially smell with her tongue the way that the snake does. So when she sticks it out, you're gonna see it's a bright blue color. And that is what she is named for. She's called a blue tongued skink. This blue tongued skink uh, is with us at Chwanky for a very similar reason as the corn snake. She was someone's pet. They, t they couldn't keep her anymore. They needed to find a home for her. So they gave her to us. We actually don't know how old she is except that we've had her since 2010. So she's probably around 14 or 15 at least. So she's definitely like getting up there in age. She's kind of like a grandma skink at this point, but she's still really healthy. If you look at her head, it kind of looks like a snake head, right? But she has these little arms and legs that she would use to crawl around with. She cannot drop her tail, though there are some skinks that can. The last resort would be dropping the tail. I'll, I'm going to bring that in and connect it to my lesson. Um, does anyone have an idea why her tongue is blue? Like, why would this animal have a blue tongue? What do we think about that? I love how many, how many raised hands you have. What do you think? Why does she have a blue tongue? Because to scale off enemies. Yeah, it would be to try to confuse predators, right? It would be a startle factor, just the same way that um, a gray, uh, excuse me, a, a red-eyed tree frog, if it's awoken from sleep, it opens its eyes and they're big and red, right? If this animal is startled, she's going to open her mouth, stick out her blue tongue. It might make the predator go, whoa, what the heck is that? And pause just enough for just long enough that she might be able to run away to safety or like dig her body into a little crevice or something like that. Um, she generally would do a lot of burrowing and we find uh, that she really likes to be under stuff. So in her travel box, she's usually under the towel. In her home back at Chwonky, she's usually under leaves or under bits of paper that we give her to burrow around. And one adaptation that she has that helps her to be a good burrower is she, her ears, which are the holes on the side of her head she can close those up with muscles, right? So she doesn't get like dirt or sand in her ears while she's burrowing around, which is pretty handy. She just stuck out her tongue. She did? Yeah. Nice. Any questions or things you'd like to know about the skink? Do they shed their skin like a snake? So yeah, this, this type of lizard and most types of lizards are gonna shed their skin in patches. So 
Um, I don't think they're as successful at shedding it all in one piece just because there's like arms and legs in there, right? And it gets a little tricky. You can't like pull it off like a long sock. Um, she tends to shed mostly all at once, but it comes off in pieces and her scales are much more snake-like. They're, they're really smooth. There are other lizards, um, and including other lizards we've had like bearded dragons that are really spiky and they tend to shed in patches. Like they'll shed the top of their head and then part of their back and then their arm and then their tail. So they're kind of shedding a different portion of their body like all the time, which is totally different from turtles, which shed like we do. So we don't really think about this, but we're constantly shedding skin cells all the time, right? We're just constantly shedding them off. Um, sometimes we think about it when we get a bad sunburn and then we're shedding them in, in big pieces, right? But it takes us about 30 days to completely shed all of our skin cells and regenerate all of them. Um, and it's kind of the same for snakes. They just do it all at once. Yes. Is she related to dinosaurs? Um, in the sense that all reptiles are related to dinosaurs. Sure. Yeah. Other questions about her? Things you want to know about the snake or anything, or excuse me, the skink or everything, anything we've talked about? Yes. Um, does she have any yeah, so th that great question. I, di I didn't really talk about where she's from. We believe that this species of blue tongue skink would be found in the wild in Irian Jaya, which is a, a part of Indonesia. Um, so we named her Indy because we think she's an Indonesian skink. I don't think she came from Indonesia. I think she was bred in this country to be a pet, right? And then was donated to us. There are lots and lots of different blue tongue skinks around the world, but that is our best guess about where we would find her. So it's kind of like a tropical area where she'd like tunnel around on the forest floor and she'd eat things that she came across, whether that's little bugs and animals or also little plants. She is an omnivore, so she'll eat both of those things. Does she eat her shedded skin? Great question. There are a lot of animals that will eat the stuff that they molt um, because it has a lot of good nutrients for them. I don't think that she eats her shedded skin, um, but that I could be wrong about that. I've never seen her do it. Um, but a lot of times animals do need to, to get those nutrients back in their body to, to re remake their new skin. Yeah. A lot of times we see that with things like um, like crayfish or crabs, right? They'll try to eat that stuff so they can build up their new skin really well. Any last questions about the blue tongue skink? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and get ready. Ooh, she just stuck her tongue out at me. <laughs> I'm gonna get ready to put Indy back in her travel box. Um, thanks for being so polite to her. It's a blue tongued skink blue tongued skink. There are lots of different types of skinks. Um, one that I have seen myself in a nature center was what's called a prehensile tailed skink, where um, they can actually use their tail to help them climb just like a monkey can, uh, which is really interesting. So that's not an animal that's going to be doing as much burrowing on the ground as much as climbing up in trees and things, which is pretty neat. Um, I hope that you learned at least one new thing and that maybe I helped you appreciate a reptile that you may have felt like maybe not as affectionate towards. Um, a lot of times reptiles might get a little bit of a bad rap in our society, um, but they're really, really cool animals and they play a really important part in our food chain and our ecosystems. Keep your eyes peeled for the rest of the summer. Um, this is when we're going to be able to observe reptiles like turtles and snakes out in our environment because come fall when we have those cold temperatures, they're all going to go find places to brumate, right? Or hibernate for the winter. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up there. Um, if you have any stories for me, more questions for me, or if you'd like to look at anything on the table that I didn't pass around, you are welcome to come up here. Um, and thank you so much for being such a wonderful audience. It was really wonderful to meet you folks. You're welcome to touch that. Yeah, because they're real teeth. You know what's weird about alligator teeth?